Hello and welcome to A Gay in the Life, where we explore different LGBTQ plus people from around the world. And today we have Jackie Cox. Jackie, welcome. Hi, Salam Blake, Salam Garrett, how are you guys? Hi. So first, can you share a little bit of where you're from and the community that you've grown up around? I'm Jackie Cox, hi. Um, I was born in Canada. Um, my dad and his family are all Canadian and my mom is Iranian. Um, and I've lived in the United States for most of my life. Uh, and I mostly lived, I grew up uh, with my mom, my mom and uh, her Iranian family. So that was kind of my dominant culture growing up. Um, okay. And now I'm a drag queen here in New York City. That's fantastic. Yeah, so when did you first start doing drag? My first ever experience with drag was um, doing a musical. I did a production of Hedwig and the Angry Inch, which was my first kind of experience with drag. But the first time I was Jackie Cox was a year later when I moved to New York City and I wanted to kind of explore my own kind of art and that's when Jackie Cox kind of came to life. It's so powerful about drag and I think Hedwig as a character uses drag for power and I realized that you know, drag gives you some exciting confidence when you hit a stage, which, you know, in my day-to-day -day life, maybe you know, I don't have as much of. But kind of through drag, I've learned how to have it, even when the wig's not on. <laughs> That's great. So did you have any um, inspirations or influences from the LGBT community growing up? I distinctly remember it was probably, I'm guessing, 96 or 97 when Ellen first came out. And that was like a really big thing. Right. I didn't even know what a lesbian really was. I didn't really yeah. understand kind of what was going on. And then from there, I started watching Will and Grace, which was, you know, uh, a, a show that was my first time really seeing gay characters on TV. And I hadn't really met any queer people until I started, you know, doing theater in high school and that was when I realized that it's not just these characters on TV that you can find a community that's welcoming to you in real life too. That's funny that you mentioned Will and Grace too because I just remember I didn't watch Will and Grace myself when I was younger but I remember seeing my mom watch it and being this you know young kid in the closet who was kind of terrified of the world in general <laughs> and just seeing her watching Will and Grace and laughing along to Will and Grace made me think, okay, everything's gonna be okay. <laughs> you know, so that visibility, it's important, I think. Yeah, and for me, you know, my mom didn't really understand what I was watching, and I think if she did, she would have probably turned off the TV. But what's nice is, I guess, you know, Will and Grace just looked like Friends or any other sitcom, and, you know, for my mom, who, who knows English, and she's speaking English really well, but she wasn't, like, watching a lot of American sitcoms, so she didn't really sure. know what was going on. And I, I wonder what it would have been like if I hadn't seen something like that. Um, yeah. It, you know, it also is part of it, the inspiration of moving to New York. It, you know, from that young age, you see that it's a city that will welcome you. Were you able to communicate that with your family or were they super open or supportive or was it the opposite or? You know, it's so funny and actually telling the story, it's like it all is kind of interrelated. So I was in my sophomore year of high school and it was my first year really doing a lot of theater in high school. And my mom was very confused, right? Because theater isn't a profession that she thought I could make money at or that was particularly right. respectable or something that was kind of in her idea or path for me. So I remember it was actually my first time visiting New York City was on a high school theater trip. And we went and we saw, you know, a bunch of musicals in the span of a few days. And when I came back home to Milwaukee, where I was at the time, I was so tired. I This was the one and only time I skipped school. I never skipped school. And a friend of mine like pretended to be my mom on the phone. And then I just like stayed home because I was so tired. But then I made a big mistake, which was that I still went to practice for the musical. <laughs> That is one of the gayer things I've ever heard, and it's amazing. <laughs> and I love my it. mom found out, and she, like, pulled me by the ear out of my rehearsal and was like, what are you doing with your life? I can't handle this. This is too crazy. You need to go live with your dad. I can't do this anymore. And I lived with my dad, and my dad was like, hey, 
your mom really doesn't want you to be doing theater, so you know, you're gonna have to focus on school and stuff. Right. And I was like, okay, okay. And then my English teacher, this is my junior year now, was like, hey, anyone who auditions for the school play gets extra credit. And I was like, well, <laughs> gotta do it. I have to do it. You're like, well, if I want an A. If I, you know, I, you said school's important. Is there, by the way, real quick to interject, is there a sacred bond between young gay guys and their English teachers? Because I feel like there is. Well, <laughs> I'm still friends with my drama, my drama club director. Drama so. club too, of course, <laughs> yeah. You know, I did love, I did love my English teachers. They, yeah. uh, this is so funny. I guess, yeah, from high school on, I had never noticed that, like how intuitive. Um, yeah. I wonder if it's because, you know, language is something that queer people have to navigate. You have to learn at a young age for your safety sometimes how to modify your language around certain people or yeah. how to, you know, use language in a way to move through a world where sometimes you can slip in and out of different spaces and queer and non-queer spaces. Um, yeah. Do you have any examples you can share of that being pertinent in your life? Yeah, oh, this is so fun. I love this conversation. I'm like sitting up now, woo. Um, yeah, it's so, you know, I loved language growing up. And yeah, I think I always loved words. It's probably how I approach drag too. If for your audience folks, uh, I was on a show called RuPaul's Drag Race. I'm not gonna of talk course. much about it, but I do think <laughs> that I uh, approached a lot of the challenges on that show from a like textual point of view, sometimes to my success, sometimes to my detriment, but you know, I do think that that's some, a way you can approach a creative art form is through the words. And for me, that goes back to the story you want to tell. Yeah. Um, so I think that's kind of the important thing as a queer person to find a way to tell your story. And the more queer stories we can tell, the more people who aren't queer will connect with us and see that it's not a bad thing. And Absolutely, yeah. for young queer kids, the more queer stories we tell, the more they feel like there's more options for them. So I think that right. that all can go back to your English teacher. I love that play. <laughs> Great. Well, and that English teacher did give me the extra credit for doing the play. What was the What was the musical? It was or It was play. a play called Dark of the Moon. Um, okay. And and my dad saw it and it was his first time seeing me do theater. And that's when he was like, "Well, your mom was wrong. This is just what you want to do. So just do whatever you want." And so, Hey, that's awesome. Hey, though. good on you, Dad. <laughs> uh, Dad, Dad's great. And then the the end of my high school experience, by that point, you know, I started having more confidence and I, you know, came out in high school. I wore rainbow t-shirts. I would rock a feather boa. Like I had more I had more guts back then probably than I do now. Um, but a lot of it was the the just finding that connection in in the theater and the arts. That was that was big for me. Oh, completely. The arts saved my life. I literally, I discovered what I wanted to do having quit the drama club and then going back into it. Yeah. So. You realize you're missing a good thing and had to go back. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, it really feels like a community that embraces what makes you unique and different as opposed to, I remember being on the swim team, it was all about like, if you don't swim as many laps as this person, you're, you know, yeah. you suck. I'm like, I don't want my life to be defined by how many laps I swim in a pool. I yeah. want my life to be defined by the different things or the different facets that make me unique. And I want to celebrate that in other people as well. You know, I feel like that's what drag is about too, right? I think drag just takes that to the, the, the best drag queens aren't the ones who necessarily can do the most tricks or the most technical skills, which are also a really fun part of drag. But for me, it's always right. exciting to just see someone who's so unique in drag. What uh, made you feel or prevented you from want uh from telling people that you were persian you know i i i was 16 years old when 9 11 happened and that was a huge moment for me and this was coming out of you know in my young you know very young i remember the gulf war and before that i remember my mom telling me the stories about the iranian revolution and the, Amer the american uh, embassy hostage crisis that happened in iran um and those were kind of like the dominant messages around Middle Eastern people growing up. And certainly at 16, when the towers fell and I felt the entire country turned against Middle Eastern people to the point yeah. where, you know, I was 
I moved to, I was in Orange County, and I remember uh, at Disneyland, they took the char- the Aladdin characters out of the parks. Wow. Oh, man. Because they That's were crazy. scared for those performers that the Aladdin characters would face racism, etc. And so these were all, like, the things I was hearing um, at the time. And people really directed it against anyone. They were, you know, we, we went, the United States declared war on an entirely different country that had nothing to do with 9-11 um, after the fact. You know what I'd love to touch back on? that you mentioned is having to alter your speech pattern or your body language by, about being around different people. I think young people, you know, having to do it on the spot and not realizing the consequences of that later or how it can affect you emotionally yeah. is something that we could actually touch on in this conversation. Totally. I think some of the earliest things I remember were my mom would say in Farsi to me, she would say, which means like, don't basically swish your butt when you walk. Like she would basically say that to me yeah. kind of constantly. And I didn't even know I was doing it or yeah. have an awareness of what that meant or what that was, right. you know, and that kind of her kind of being on me in that sense really made me in some ways a lot more self-conscious about how I held myself, how I moved my body, um, mm-hmm. how I spoke. You're not, I mean, you're totally not alone in that feeling. I had a team of people when they were trying to make me seem like a straight person for years. One of my reps at the time had tried to talk to me about the way I walk. And I was like, what do you mean? I just, I walk like a person. And they were like, no, you walk like this. And it was because of dancing. I held my shoulders back. My spine was right. My butt was out. You know what I mean? It's like, and I remember specifically, it was kind of like a movie walking through Beverly Hills. And I was walking like me and my friend goes, no, no, no. He goes, slouch your shoulders, tuck in your tailbone walk like you don't care and like drag your feet a little bit. And so I remember walking, I was like, this sucks, my back hurts. And like, it's those things that I was like, this is so silly. We're just, I'm not an actor walking around in the streets. I should be an actor being hired to do a, to do a job, Yeah, you know? I think that can that kind of thing can also be really damaging in the long run too. You know, if you have someone telling you, hey, you're being yourself and yourself is wrong, you know, that is going to have a long-term effect, you know, depending on what age you are and who it is that's saying it to you. If it's someone that you really respect that's saying, you know, stand up straight or don't speak that way or don't say these words, that sort of thing, it can have a a lasting effect that Mm -hmm. can be negative, you know. Mm -hmm. So luckily both of you came out of your your slumps with it and that's great. Now I just walk like this everywhere. Woo! (laughs) Yeah! Like one of those inflatable (laughs) tube things at a car dealership. Yeah, this is how I walk down the street now. Actually, you know, I really loved what you said because I was actually about to ask you if you could give advice to to younger you or to a young person right now, what would it be? I think I would say to a younger version of myself or anyone out there who feels maybe judged for who they are or feel like they can't be themselves is that the more you move in life, the more you realize that the things that you think are things you have to hide are really the things that if you celebrate them, then everyone around you who really matters will celebrate them with you. And whatever the things are that you think aren't great, they're great. It's scary because You may run into people who don't celebrate those things about you. And what you have to know is that that has nothing to do with you. And so what I would tell my younger self is whatever it is that makes you you is something people will want to celebrate.